Welcome everybody to the first um, Gorilla Foundation World Gorilla Day webinar via Zoom. So I'd like to introduce you first to um, the speakers, Let's starting with um, uh, Ian Redmond, um, who is world-renowned gorilla expert, um, biologist, conservationist, and he's really become an international ambassador for the species um, and that he's come to know, know so well. And so we're, we're very happy to have him here and he's become a good friend of the Gorilla Foundations. So thank Thanks. you, Ian. And to his whatever side you can, <laughs> to his left <laughs> is um, Dr. Penny Patterson, the president and director of research at the Gorilla Foundation. Um, and we're all here in a way, the title of this um, session is thinking about Coco on World Gorilla Day. So this is really kind of inspired the idea by, by Coco and, and who better to represent Coco than Penny. And um, Penny will be telling about her experiences, past, present, and future. She's having future experiences right now, I understand, <laughs> thinking about how it should be. Uh, and then uh, um, finally, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Krista Nunes, who originally was a, an engineer, um, biomedical engineer, in fact, she had, I think, an experiment that flew on the space shuttle at one time, and she's come back down to Earth. And she, after a visit with mountain gorillas, I believe it was in Rwanda, um, had an epiphany that that was something that she wanted to spend the rest of her life working with, helping them. And she came to the Gorilla Foundation and soon after became Penny's associate director of research. And she's been that almost ever since and um, been through the thick and the thin with us and Thank you for being here, Krista. So um, this is gonna be a, sort of a panel discussion, you know, questions and answers, and we're just gonna kinda, this is about gorillas. I know most of you out there aren't thinking about gorillas, you're thinking about humans and how difficult it's been lately. But I think it's good every once in a while to, to think about other species that are also struggling and how we can help them because as we help them, we help ourselves. Um, as we help them and as we help nature, we're all interconnected, interdependent it really reflects back on ourselves and it, uh, it feels good to make progress and we can make progress. That's one thing that come clear to us at the Gorilla Foundation is lots can be done, not a lot of money to help gorillas. Okay, so let's start with, um, with Ian and uh, I'm gonna ask you, first question that comes to my mind is, are gorillas still critically endangered? They've been in that status for, seems for a long time uh, how has that changed over time, over the past 10 years, and maybe more recently? And um, just kind of give us an overview of that. Let me switch. Okay, Ian. Sure. Uh, thank you, Gary. And uh, I, I'm delighted to be taking part in this discussion because um, as a self-confessed gorilla holic and, and gorilla file, uh, I know I'm in good company and I'm sure most of the audience uh, would categorize themselves in that way too. Um, gorilla conservation uh, has some good news and some not so good news. Uh, so let's start with the, the, the bad news. You're right, critically endangered is how three of the four kinds of gorillas that we currently recognize are classed by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that do the red list. And so the red list is how close a species is to extinction. Is it vulnerable to extinction? Is it threatened? Is it endangered or is it critically endangered um, and until very recently all four kinds of gorillas were considered to be critically endangered uh, which is is very sad when you care about gorillas and when you've been inspired by them excuse but me the, and, and can i ask you to i meant to do this first define those four subspecies most people are not aware of them and think mostly about mountain gorillas yes well i'm coming to that because the mountain gorillas are the good news um in, in that their numbers are showing a, um, a steady but slow recovery uh, to such an extent that a little over a year ago the IUCN decided actually they're no longer critically endangered we can reduce that to just endangered which is bad enough but better than being on the critical list uh, and that's on the basis of this recovery now the recovery is something that I've been involved in um, since the mid 70s when I had the very good fortune to go and work with the late Dr. Diane Fossey um, as her dog's body, basically, at the Camp Gopher. Um, so I went to help out at Karisoki and 
while I was there, um, I obviously I became hooked on gorillas in, in a serious fashion, rather like Krista did. They're very charismatic and, and they're, they're, they're wonderful in many ways, which we'll perhaps elaborate on later. And for many people, because they have been the most filmed and photographed kind of gorilla, they're the, the gorilla people think of. You say gorilla people think of big, shaggy, hairy gorillas high in the mountains of, of Central Africa. Um, but those are really quite an outlying population um, and are considered now to be a subspecies of the eastern gorilla. So for most of my career as a gorillaologist, I've been telling people there's one species and two or three subspecies. And then around the turn of the millennium, um, the DNA evidence returned the situation to how it was when the species were first described, that those in the east are one species and those in the west are another species. So in many people's minds, well, there's mountain gorillas and there's lowland gorillas, and then there's eastern and west and lowland. But ever since this reclassification based on the DNA evidence, we've considered them to be two species, one in the east, one in the west. And in the eastern species, you've got the eastern lowland and the mountain. And some people would go further and say, well, the mountain gorilla, which is in two populations, that in the Virungas that Diane Fossey studied, and that in Bwindi in Uganda which is only a dozen miles or so apart from, from the Virunga population, but they've been separate for hundreds of years and they, are, they look different, but genetically they're almost identical. So most people say, okay, those are all the mountain gorillas. And then the, the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which when I first went there was called Zaire, um, but is now DRC. In the east of the DRC, you've got these Eastern lowland gorillas those have seen a catastrophic decline in recent years. In the past two decades, they've gone from something like 17,000 down to probably three and a half thousand. 3,800 is the official estimate, but that's based on very poor data because it's in a, a basically a war zone. There's a, lo a lot of civil unrest in the east of the DRC, and so people have um, been unable to do accurate census work. And it's pretty difficult to do accurate census work with gorillas anyway, because they live in dense forests and they're very shy when they're frightened. Most gorillas are scared to death of humans, so they just flee and it's hard to observe them. You just have to count nests and work out how many gorillas built the nests over a period of time. So that's the eastern species, Gorilla beringii. Um, and the western lowland gorilla, which is the one which, if you've been to a zoo or, or if you've been following Coco's uh, life, that's a better known gorilla in captivity. Um, there are no mountain gorillas in captivity. And until recently, there was only one or two Eastern Lowland. I think they've now died. So, so basically gorillas in captivity are Western Lowland. Um, but the little population that's found on the borders of Nigeria and Cameroon and is separated geographically from the rest of the Western Lowland gorillas, uh, those are now considered to be a different subspecies, that's the cross river gorilla. And that is the least numerous. There are probably only about 250, 280 of those left. And that's in about a dozen little subpopulations, so a really precarious situation. And great efforts are underway to try and turn that around, um, but not by following the mountain gorilla example of getting them used to humans so that people can come and see them because they're still subject to hunting. And the last thing you want to do is to get a gorilla that's possibly going to be hunted by the next human they meet to start to trust humans. No, no. So the people studying them study them the day after they left. So they follow the trail sign, they count the nests, they collect samples of the DNA from the dung, but they don't try and watch them. But they have now got some camera traps. So there's some nice camera trap footage of cross river gorillas. Um, the Western lowland gorilla is the most numerous. And, and again, a few years ago, we were thinking there were probably 100,000 and the numbers were declining. And then this great area of swamp, which was thought not to include gorillas because everybody knew from mountain gorillas that gorillas don't like water. Um, but mountain gorillas are a different species and the water they don't like is often fast flowing streams that could be dangerous. Turns out that Western lowland gorillas like to sit up to their armpits in water, feeding on water plants in a swamp. And when is very difficult to access and difficult to count. The gorillas area was um, censused a little bit, not accurately, not like the mountain gorillas where you count every one from their nests or from their dung and DNA, but just estimating. The estimate is there might be somewhere between 200 and 300,000 Western wow. Northern gorillas, 
which is fantastic news, a lot more than we thought there were, but they're still considered to be critically endangered because they've had such severe losses in recent uh, times from bushmeat hunting and from Ebola, which is one of the big threats to gorillas. So I'm sure we'll talk later about zoonotic diseases because we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that's kind of important. Um, but Ebola is a disease which not only affects humans, it affects all the great apes. So gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos also have a very high mortality if Ebola gets into their population. So that's the four kinds of gorillas, cross river, least numerous, western island gorilla most numerous, eastern island gorilla 3,800 but catastrophic decline from 17,000 and mountain gorilla, the good news story um, that have gone from an estimated, well, pr pretty well counted 250 in the Virungas, not quite sure in Windy 40 odd years ago, to today they're up at just over a thousand. So that's about a two and a half times increase in number as a result of 40 years of hard work from with conservationists of all nationalities um, and all the hundreds of thousands of tourists who have been there and paid their money and helped pay the park guards to allow those numbers to pick up. Ian, can you say something um, a little more about the bushmeat trade, especially as it affects the western lowland gorilla population, the rate of decline? I mean, they're, they're the most numerous, but, but what is the rate of decline and, and why? We, we don't know the rate of decline because we don't have accurate enough data, um, but we do know that there are some cultures in the Congo Basin and further west that regard gorilla meat as really special. Mm -hmm. It's considered as, as big man's meat. If you're the chief of a village and you're inviting your neighboring chiefs to come and have a, a, a discussion under a tree, if you don't serve them gorilla meat, you're, like, you're disrespecting them. Mm -hmm. You're not showing them how important they are. So that, that cultural value attached to gorilla meat in some areas um, leads to the, them to be hunted. There's also a, a belief in a sort of semi-magical properties of gorilla meat and gorilla bones. That if you have a sickly child and you tie a gorilla finger around the middle, or if it's a youth and then not, not building up their body mass enough and you want them to be stronger, then, then you might, might go to the market and buy a gorilla finger on a hand that probably came off a gorilla that was killed for bushmeat. And then you'd, you'd burn that finger to, uh, to carbon, grind it up and cut your son's arm and rub the, the gorilla in to sort of vaccinate him. It's been described as vaccinating him with the strength of a gorilla. Mm -hmm. It probably more likely give him sepsis, uh, but uh, if he survives that, then maybe he will be stronger. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Um, but sadly, that belief, and, and in some cases, just the fact that, that gorillas, like all of us, are made of meat, and in a culture where the, there's no tradition of keeping cattle or sheep or goats because they don't do well in tropical rainforests, then most people get their animal protein from the wild. And whilst most of it is large bodied rodents, uh, which reproduce very rapidly and, and it's not a conservation problem for them to be hunted, um, uh, some species of antelope, especially the bush diker, they seem able to cope with a lot of heavy hunting. Uh, buffalo, um, animals which you, you might think, well, okay, you know, the wild equivalent of cattle. So if we eat cows, eating buffalo is not so different. But then it gets more controversial if you, if you have a, um, an ethical consideration for the animals themselves, because if you start talking about primates and elephants that have got big brains and complex societies and are self-aware beings, then I have a real problem with people hunting them because th these are essentially self-aware autonomous beings. And we know from captive studies, given half a chance, you can strike up a conversation with them. We'll hear, hear more about that from the people best able to talk about the language abilities of, of gorillas. Um, so the bushmeat trade is a problem because more and more people are living in cities, but they hanker after the, 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 the cooking of the village. So they pay good money for people to bring meat from the bush into the city markets. And the size of the cities is growing and the size of the, the, the bush is shrinking. So you can see we're, we're, we're past the point where that might be sustainable. And for species that like, like gorillas and elephants that breed very slowly uh, and are really affected by the loss of members of their community, uh, I think there is no case for saying, well, you know, like there is a, a rule that allows some tribes 
who traditionally hunted whales to continue to keep their tribal culture alive to hunt an occasional whale it's aboriginal whaling um, there isn't a case for that with gorillas in, in my view um, i say to people who hunt gorillas look just taking out one or two a year from a community that community will decrease in number and disappear so you can stop hunting gorillas now when there are still some left in the forest or you can stop hunting them when you've killed them all and that will happen and we see it happening all over the place as pockets of forests are reduced in size and then all the large mammals are killed and sold as bushmeat uh, it's happening across west africa with chimpanzees and central uh, and western part of east africa with gorillas and chimpanzees the, the only gorillas that seem exempt from that are the mountain gorillas because they happen to be surrounded by human cultures that don't eat gorilla so lucky them that they're, they're not hunted for meat there are some traditional uses for medicine and they're sometimes seen as a problem animal if they come out of the forest and rip your banana trees apart then um, they might be killed in those circumstances but almost across the the whole range there are 10 countries in africa with gorillas i should have mentioned that yeah. um, and those 10 countries all of them except for um, rwanda and uganda and the eastern part of drc that has mountain gorillas are seeing gorilla numbers decline and the ones which uh, we know best because they're habituated and people can go see them on holiday those are the mountain gorillas and their numbers are picking up now we somehow have to apply the lessons that we've learned in the east where appropriate to other populations to try and turn those around um, but sadly that probably isn't going to follow the same path of tourism because as mentioned earlier we're in the middle of a global pandemic and everyone is terrified that some tourists will come in and possibly infect the gorillas with COVID-19 or some other human disease so a lot of things are in flux at the moment as, as with all our lives we've been, had our lives turned upside down by this this what is it a few strands of self-replicating rna yeah that we call, call SARS-CoV-2 and this might be a good time to to actually zoom in so to speak on that what is the effect of the global pandemic on great on gorillas in particular and because they they can get the same diseases we do and we can transmit them and i would imagine that that would even increase by through bushmeat um consumption so how is it how have, how have things changed since the beginning of this year due to COVID-19? Well clearly COVID-19 at least the, the measures governments have introduced to try and slow the rate of transmission of COVID-19 um, have have brought the international tourism industry to a halt. So all the conservation projects that depended on tourism and people pay a lot of money to go and see gorillas and that's fantastic mm -hmm. um it, it's like a, a night at the opera in a really smart box you pay that kind of money fifteen hundred dollars for a ticket to go and see the gorillas was the price in rwanda uh, a bit less six hundred dollars in in um in uganda um and 400 in drc but that's um got a lot of insecurity and most people don't want to go on holiday to such an insecure area but the the the, the revenue from those um tourism um, from that tourism business uh, is what was paying the rangers and protecting the gorillas and it was it's, it's you know it's a 40-year success story mm -hmm. more than that um, so that's that's fantastic COVID-19 has both stopped almost all international travel so there are very few international tourists coming in um, and the big fear is that if they do start to return and rwanda has now reopened gorilla tourism uganda has now reopened gorilla tourism i was watching a live facebook feed visit to the gorillas in uganda the other day that the uganda wildlife authority was putting out to the world to show the world that they were open for business but of course it's very hard to get there at the moment and if you do go there you, you're perhaps afraid that on the plane you picked up mm -hmm. covid19 and that if you're leaning on a bamboo pole even though you're not feeling bad yourself when you've left if that virus is still on that shiny stem maybe it'll be viable for a couple of days and a gorilla might climb up that stem mm -hmm. so there's a real fear about the risk of infection of, of transmitting COVID-19 to gorillas and the measures that have been taken all, all 
along during the, the development of the tourism, which was to maintain a distance of about seven meters between the tourists and the gorillas, um, and to limit the visit to one hour. And in many places, you were asked to wear a surgical mask. Some places you weren't, but right now, absolutely everywhere is saying, no, surgical masks, washing of hands, extreme hygiene measures, and increase that minimum distance to 10 meters. Now you can explain that to the tourists, but you can't explain it to the gorillas. So what sometimes happens is that gorillas come from behind you and barge past, excuse me, elbow you out the way because they've got an eye on a food plant ahead of you. And that contact in the time of a pandemic could be fatal. So there's a lot of concern about how to safely resume this successful method of conservation. But for most gorillas, that isn't the way they're being conserved. And, and when you go and see Western lowland gorillas, the chances are you're going to be sitting on a platform in a tree looking out across a by, maybe 50, 100 meters away from the gorillas, watching them with binoculars. It's not so close, but it's much safer. So maybe that's the new method for gorilla tourism. Krista, okay. sorry, you were going to say something. Are they requiring testing of any kind for the visitors, or it's just based on how they feel? In the past, it was based on how you felt. And if you admitted to feeling unwell, then you might get a refund. But if you try and go and see the gorillas and then you turn out to be coughing and sneezing, then you'll be um, prevented. Uh, now, even to get into Rwanda, you have to have, or, or into Uganda, you have to have a test before you travel. Uh, and I don't know if they'd require another one before you go and see the gorillas, but um, the, yeah, it's, it's become much more difficult. And, and I think the, the post-COVID system is still being worked out. Mm -hmm. So, Ian, I have a, another comment. We, I, we've talked about this. You've been thinking about this for a long time, but isn't this the perfect opportunity for virtual ecotourism? Using Zoom, for example, to follow a guide, just one person in. Yeah, well, that, that's what, literally two days ago, I was watching a Uganda Wildlife Authority um, live feed uh, for that, you've got to have a gorilla group that is within reach of a, a mobile phone mast. Well, as it turns out, many of the mountain gorillas fit that that requirement because um, they're on a mountain and, and you know, they're sort of in line of sight of the phone masts. So it is possible to have a live feed, but the quality was very poor. Uh, in time, I'm sure that will get better. And what they were saying was, you know, the, the live feed might be a bit blurry, but we're shooting HD um, material, which will be released later. later in the day once they've edited it. So that's getting there. And, and of course, as you, as you alluded to, I, I've been involved with Vico Tourism, V for virtual ecotourism. Mm -hmm. And if you go to vicotourism.org, you can actually take the World Gorilla Day Safari that I did on the inaugural World Gorilla Day, um, and visit one of the groups in Rwanda, then go up to Diane Fossey's uh, grave, and then go to a, a museum exhibit that the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International put together in the nearby town of Musanzi. It's free, it's on vicotourism.org, um, and if you have a, a VR headset, there's even a way of watching it in an app uh, called Vico Tours, which allow you to actually, you know, you, you stick your headset on and uh, here you are. You suddenly, you're, you're in the forest. And as far as anyone else is concerned, you're sitting on the sofa. But there, especially if you've got earphones on, uh -huh. you're, you're virtually there. And, and that could be a, a new way. At the moment, it's free. But why not, as you suggest, have a, a daily visit, which is only available to people who pay a small subscription? Yes. And that money helps to pay for the park guards. I think that is probably going to come. We just haven't worked out the uh, mechanics yet. I mean, if that's scaled up, and there are many people that could help scale it up, you could have millions of, of tourists rather than dozens. Yeah, well, millions paying $5 each rather than yeah. uh, eight yeah. people paying $1,500 each. Yes. Uh, it could work. So uh, I, I want to give uh, Penny a chance to, and, and Krista too, so that we can, and we can come back to this later. But is there anything you want to say about... Um, what direction do you think people should be taking that they're not right now in, in solving this problem? Besides the problem, problem of gorilla conservation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's a, <laughs> the, the, the line that, that I and many of my colleagues in, in the UN have been pursuing um, for the past decade or so is that, that since 2009, when the UN Climate Convention 
recognize the importance of tropical forests in preventing dangerous climate change. Uh, those of us who work in tropical forests have been stressing to the negotiators that forests are not just trees. Most of the trees in tropical rainforests depend on animals to disperse their seeds and to pollinate them and to prune them and to fertilize them. Animals are an integral part of the forests. Mm -hmm. So if you want there to be permanence in your tropical rainforest carbon store, you have to protect the animals as much as the, the plants. Because without the animals, the next generation of plants isn't going to grow. Or if it does grow, it might just be wind dispersed seeds. So the biodiversity of thousands of tree species in every hectare isn't going to happen unless you've got the animals. So governments in the developed world are pledging huge sums of money to ensure that, that these carbon stores are protected. Um, but they're still mostly thinking of sticks of carbon, not the gears in the machine, which are the animals that move the seeds around and pollinate the, the flowers and um, are the, what makes the forest work. So what we have to do is to remind our elected representatives, our climate change negotiators, that gorillas are second only to elephants in importance as seed dispersal agents in the African forests in the 10 countries where they live. Um, elephants are important in 50 countries, uh, 37 in Africa and 13 in Asia. Um, orangutans are important in two countries, chimpanzees in 21 countries, and of course the whole of Latin America doesn't have apes, but it has spider monkeys and muriquis and all these different species of primate and tapirs and toucans that disperse the seeds. And if you allow them to go extinct or just reduce in numbers to such a point that you might say, oh, well, they haven't gone extinct, but there's only a tenth or a, a, a fifth of, of what there was 100 years ago, then you're recognizing that if you think of them as gardeners of the forest and you used to have a staff of a thousand gardeners and now you've got a staff of 50 gardeners, the forest ain't going to be the same. And that's very much the kind of population declines that we've seen for all the large mammals. And uh, we've been hear, hearing in the last few days of the, um, what is it, 68% overall decline in, in um, vertebrate biomass, the, mammal, the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, just the numbers of individual animals has gone down because of human activities. And, and now if you look at mammalian biomass, that's the, just the weight of all the mammals. Um, what is it, 60% of it is cattle and goats and sheep and uh, livestock. Then there's 36% of, of humans. We weigh 36% of the mammalian biomass and just 4% out of all the mammal weight on earth is wildlife. That's the whales, the elephants, the gorillas, everything. So we, we have just completely messed up and we have to start to restore those numbers. And I think one of the best reasons for doing that is to explain to people that these are, these are gardeners. We need them to keep the forest healthy and we need the forests to keep our climate stable. And that's, that's a very, humans are very good at self-interest. We have a very anthropocentric viewpoint. So if you can bring it down to why is it important to me and my kids that there are gorillas in a forest? Yeah, they're cute, they're lovely, they share a lot of DNA with us. Those are all very you know, anthropocentric reasons, but they're part of the, the biosphere that keeps our planet habitable. And that's a really big reason. Whereas the fact that I like them and have, have met individual gorillas and known them as friends, just as, as Penny and, and Christian you have, that, that makes it, you know, it gives us a personal motivation. But we have to be a bit more objective and say, well, for the good of the planet, we need gorillas to be eating fruit and pooping out the seeds and, and building nests and, and fertilizing the soil and doing all the things that gorillas do. Because if we don't protect those forests, our chances of stabilizing our climate, we don't have a chance. We need but those. I'm glad you made that connection. I mean, it, in fact, you just set the stage now. You, you, the global picture, all the connections, and um, I think this would be a good a good time to now now to zoom in to the things that make up that global view, the personal connections that we have with gorillas, the uh, one on ones, because that that's a, a, a people have a hard time thinking about species and environment sometimes, but they think about my family, my children, my relationships, and I'd like to <laughs> to take this opportunity to turn to Penny. So I want to. We'll come back to this and spend a few minutes at the end on, on solutions. So Penny, Dr. Patterson, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, you, you've been listening to this and, and sometimes it's overwhelming how big the problem is, but you've dealt with the problem on a more personal level. You've spent almost five decades working with gorilla, three gorillas, Coco, Michael, and Ndumi, and raising them and getting to know them and learning from them and teaching them and so forth. And w was it worth it? <laughs> what have you, what, what would you say are the major lessons you've learned? We'll start with a really big question in that life of working personally one-on-one -on -one with gorillas. Well, I always say the first thing is humility. Um, I, you know, grew up loving all animals, just completely. That was my world. Everything that I that was interested in was there in Minnesota, in window wells and swamps, and so I had a really lucky um, upbringing. Also, with um, role model parents who allowed me to do all that. <laughs> No rains. Um, and so that led me to my um, interest in primates, uh, which of course you're not going to find in the forest of Minnesota. Um, but I read about them and I just felt that they were like the epitome of what I would love to learn more about. And, and in doing that, um, I, yes, I learned that they are like our family. They are they are persons and this is something that's now going to go before the court is is um as gorillas as intelligent autonom autonomous beings do they have a right to be protected as persons This is the part where he's going off to school. Who's they back? Poor Luca goes away and they all kiss him and kiss him and kiss him goodbye. Oh, honey, it's sad. I know it's a sad scene. Oh, and they're crying. They are crying on the movie. Oh, honey, and there's trouble, sad, trouble, bad. Oh, sweetie, with the mother, yes, the sweet mother, the one who adopted him. She's so sweet. Well, I know, it's uh, hard to watch that, so you didn't want to. Oh, up there. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, she loves this one. Get her handing this one. Selection today. Wow. I love yoga. Oh, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if you wanted that one or not. You do. Okay. You're just handing over all of your favorites. Oh, yeah. That one. This is a good one. Has a lesson to it. And so um, I'm also working on that uh, with Krista to get um, evidence that this should be. Uh, and just knowing each gorilla, they're individuals, very different personalities. Um, Coco, very outgoing and very um, communicative and uh, just amazing the things I discovered in the first 10 years, if you just read The Education of Coco, which was co-written with Eugene Linden, um, she, in my opinion, she did everything to qualify her as a person. All the communications, uh, you know, indicating passage of time, indicating um, complex things like joking and um, 
she, she, she was quite, she had quite a sense of humor and would use that humor in her signing. Um, one day, um, Barbara Hiller, who was one of the founders uh, for the project, was asking Coco to sign drink and Coco was, before she was to get the drink and she would not do it. And Barbara said, come on, you know the sign, you can do it. Please, please sign drink for me before I give it to you. And she took the drink sign and put it in her ear. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other thing she did to Barbara, which was fascinating is Barbara asked Coco to show her something scary and Coco got a mirror and held it up to Barbara. <laughs> So, um, Coco, by the way, early on indicated uh, that she knew who she was in the mirror, something, self-awareness, clearly. Um, but in the early days, she said, I want to ask her, who's that in the mirror? She said, I think that's me, um, animal, gorilla. Uh, and then in one case, she added, fine, animal, gorilla. And I said, oh, oh yes, you are. Very fine. Um, and when a reporter asked her um, whether she was an animal or a person, she said she was, that's when she, the quote came out, fine, animal gorilla. Uh, later on, her definition changed. And she now, uh, she, she toward, when she got older, um, considered her a fine person gorilla. And uh, we asked her about dogs, and they didn't. <laughs> she didn't. She didn't allow that they were persons. <laughs> so she had opinions, much like humans, of similarity to us would then be something that would merit. Uh, she had a hierarchy. Yes, there's a hierarchy, and uh, she was a cat lover, by the way, um, not a dog lover. Someone just offered her a dog for uh, a to take care of and she handed it immediately right back to me <laughs> uh, but so there's a, there's so much richness in um what what we've learned from her it, it, this is just a, a tiny amount of it every day it was amazing uh there were surprises uh, she's she had reading teachers um volunteers teacher volunteers usually retired who would um, work with her on reading. And uh, it became obvious when I made a set of cards, hundreds of cards with words on them or phrases on them that she was using them to communicate with us when we weren't there. In the morning, we would find statements of various kinds. Um, and uh, I can't remember all of them, but uh, we documented those that, that she was able to talk about things that weren't present. One of them was when um, the zoos com uh, communicated with us at one point that there was a gorilla that we might, might be delivered to us who was ill. Uh, and then uh, a day or so later, they said, oh no, I'm sorry that the, that baby gorilla died. Coco, when we talked about that later, she had laid out uh, a gravestone, a baby, and a train. These were in the cards. Some of them were words, some of them were images, um, some of them had both. So that she just overheard that conversation and the next morning I saw that. Um, so she's able to use many ways to indicate what she understands. Um, that's, and that's just a few of them. <laughs> Is Coco unique in that regard, or is she a special gorilla, or are other gorillas capable of these things too, do you think? Basically? Oh, yeah. other gorillas are definitely capable of this same amount of intelligence. Michael was a storyteller, and one of the things that I read in the Stanford Magazine was that at, at one point, maybe before this happened, uh, storytelling was the defining characteristic of a human. No animals can do that. Um, it turns out that Michael was telling stories very early. Uh, well, as soon as he had the words for cat and eat and bird he, and bad, he was signing cat eat bird, bad cat. <laughs> and over and over, he was just 
he must have, we, we figure he must have seen a, a cat hunting a, a, a bird and consuming it. But he also told us many times that with uh, not just me, but Barbara Weller documented him talking about what happened to his mother. Basically, Barbara Weller asked Michael, tell me about your mother. And he said, you, Anne, she, uh, you and Anne was, she, he had a series of nannies <laughs> and Anne was one and Barbara was another. Um, and she said, no, no, tell me about your gorilla mother. And he launched into this narrative that uh, he repeated with me once or twice and with her once or twice. And we captured it on film um, when he was older. And he basically he invented signs to describe loud noise and then cut neck. And he went through, we have this on video, maybe we can show that, a series of things about what, describing her murder and possibly butchering. Well, m mention where he grew up and where, where that happened, how that happened. Yes, he was a bushmeat orphan, obviously, to be able to tell that story. Um, he had to have witnessed that, that horrible trade. Um, and so he, was born in um, uh, Cameroon, mm -hmm. a little bit of a redhead. Cameroon seems to be, have redhead gorillas, um, and came to us as a companion for Coco. Uh, we, but Coco was told that there would be a baby coming, and when she saw him at age two or three, in between there, we didn't know his exact age, she said, wrong old <laughs> so, but she still loved him <laughs> and Ian has a question um, yes I, I know that you have used the story of Coco's kitten to open people's eyes in Cameroon to the cognitive abilities of gorillas so that they might feel different about eating them um, I don't think has anyone used that story of, of Michael's description of his mother's death and, and dismembering, um, because that I think would be very powerful. If, if you have a way of portraying that, if you can get an artist or if you have the, the images of the, the signing, I, I, yeah, what a, what a great, powerful way to, to convince someone that this, this, this is a person, not uh, an animal that you should be eating. Let me, let me, let me address. Tony Rose wrote, wrote a book called <laughs> Michael's Story. Michael's Dream. And Michael's Dream, sorry. <laughs> we have Coco's, we're going to have and do my story, Coco's Kitten and Michael's Dream um, that he illustrated when he didn't have photos. Um, he went to Africa and I think did get some bush meat photos. Uh, so that we're in development of getting that published right now. And I think it would be very powerful to have Coco's Kitten and Michael's Dream out there in the country the, and in the languages they speak. Coco's Kitten was translated into other languages. Let me just uh, add something French. to that. Let, let me add something to that. So yeah, Tony Rose, um, who, who wrote with us Michael's Dream, for a long time thought that that would be the more powerful story in terms of affecting behaviors in Africa because he was born in Africa, basically, and he was a male. And, um, and so he wanted those two to go out there together. And he did do some pilot studies with the book, a draft of the book, Michael's Dream, with very positive results. We never published those results. We need to do more studies. But it really did make a difference in changing attitudes of both teachers and students there when they read that book about how they felt about gorillas in general. And one other thing is, I think we all feel that the video might be even more, a more powerful way of conveying it. Watching him tell that story in real life can be more persuasive than reading about it. So that's why we're building that into this app to do that. We must do that. Yes. No more excuses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, agreed, agreed. So listen, yeah. I think this would be a good time to, uh, to give Krista the stage, the floor, for a bit. And let me switch over to Krista. Okay, so uh, Krista, Dr. Nunes, um, as Associate Director of Research with Penny, 
Um, you've been through a lot with her um, from, you know, Coco's heyday through, and uh, I don't know if you were there when Michael passed away in the year 2000. Okay. And then Ndume, especially you had a good relationship with Ndume who, and then Coco passed away in the year 2018 and Michael was transferred back to a zoo in 2019. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? I know they were hard for everyone, but you were right there on the ground with it. How were they for you and what, what has happened since? Yeah, very challenging life experiences for sure. Um, Coco's passing was difficult. I felt like we all came together as a team, the caregivers, it was a great team at the time. So we could lean on each other and get through that time, share stories. Um, and Dume's moving on to another zoo was another big loss, but a different kind of loss. So once, you know, we fought really hard to keep him at the foundation, but in the end, he was going to be moved back to a zoo. So that whole process, once we knew he wasn't going to be at the Gorilla Foundation anymore, we kind of transitioned to how do we make this as smooth of a transition for him as possible. So we kind of shifted to that and what did that look like and what did we need to do? So I think we came together again with um, Ndume's primary caregiver at the time and came up with a good training plan to get him used to voluntarily going in the crate so he could not be stressed out by being anesthetized. And we also had to do some medical studies to see if his heart was okay for transfer. So we just came together, did the work and were able to transfer him there. But through that whole process, I learned a lot about the differences between how gorillas lived at the Gorilla Foundation versus at zoos. So at the Gorilla Foundation, they were given a lot of autonomy, a lot of choice built into their days. Um, so they could determine if they wanted to be inside or outside, if they wanted to play or just rest peacefully. Um, and it's not like that at a zoo. So generally their days are pretty well managed by the staff. So they, they don't have a lot of choice. Um, another difference at the Gorilla Foundation is there's no visitors. And as Ian said, gorillas are generally shy. And so having people come and look at them is hard for some of them. So, and in Dume especially, he did not like having people come look at him. So. You know, it's a big change, a big transition for him. I know he's well cared for and loved where he is now, but his life is a lot different, looks a lot different than it used to. Well, is that, how is that good or bad, um, the differences, and how does that apply? Maybe, general, maybe you could generalize that a bit to all gorillas and zoos. Yeah, I, I guess knowing gorillas and having had the, pleasure of having those deep relationships with them, I, it, I feel like they don't belong in the current situation that they're in in zoos. I, they need to have more choice. They need to be able to determine if they want to be on or off exhibit. Um, and if they are off exhibit, a lot of times at zoos, the spaces where they are behind the scenes are much different looking than the spaces that the visitors can come see. So having space, if they choose to be off exhibit, that still looks naturalistic, I think should be a priority. So right now, zoos aren't exactly designed with the well-being of gorillas in mind. They also have to consider what it's going to be like for the zoo visitors and ease of care of the populations that they're managing. So I think we need to shift away from that a little bit and think more about the well-being of the gorillas. Can you say something about the role of two-way communication? Yeah, that, that's another big change for Ndume. He had to transition away from the way we communicate him with, with him on a daily basis all throughout the day to now where he is, he doesn't really get to experience that as much. So I know when I went to visit him, he was very eager to communicate with me and all the different ways we do that. So that's also a big change and a big, what I consider a loss for him. So when I was there, he wanted to spend the whole time either you know, sitting with me or me signing with him or communicating with him in the other ways that we have done at the foundation, which includes sign or asking questions, putting a hand up with, you know, two different choices so he could pick which one he preferred. 
And so how, how, how did the zoo, uh, other caregivers re react when they saw you interacting with, with Ndume and, and um, you know, and him enjoying it, but they were sort of, they sort of felt left out, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. Traditionally, they haven't promoted that sort of communication with gorillas. So, I mean, I hope my being there and them seeing how he responded to that gave them an idea of maybe it would be something to pursue. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that having a strong relationship with the human caregivers benefits the gorillas in captivity. It improves the relationships among the gorillas themselves. Um, so I, I don't really see a downside to it. Mm -hmm. I know there's some concern about um, teaching gorillas a human language and why don't we just learn their ways of communicating. Well, a, a lot of the communication gets established naturally just by spending time together. Mm -hmm. And I know we weren't specifically teaching Ndume English or sign, but he picked it up anyway. And, and, and I can understand why they'd want to learn some of their natural gestures so that they don't change them, you know, force them to change. But isn't it true that having a common language to start with can be the quote, like a Rosetta Stone that helps you to learn their language? You can't yeah. just jump to a language. Right. You can build off of that common right. ground. Right. And I think there's no question that having that open line of communication improves care. I mean, it's just they can tell you what they need and you can provide it. I wanna ask you the same question I asked Ian. Is there any potential for a virtual model for zoos, just as we talked about ecotourism? I mean, yeah, I mean, I really hope it moves in that direction where a zoo becomes more like a sanctuary and then you're providing virtual experiences. I think because of um, the way things are right now, a lot of zoos have done that, switched to that because they couldn't have visitors coming. So they're providing like home experiences. Right, I, there, there doesn't seem to be enough of that though. It's hard to find and I guess it, maybe it's because zoos are used to having people come and visit and they're afraid if they show too much online, they won't come. That's possible. <laughs> they, need, they need to create a business model so that it's just as lucrative for people to subscribe as to visit. Anyway, um, okay, thank you. That, that was great, Alden. I wanna open it up now as we near the end of this webinar, let's go to gallery view. Um, and just ask any of you, um, now that you've heard each other, there's some things that you forgot to say that you'd like to say now. Just raise your hand. Well, what I was hoping um, Christy was gonna tell us was, was what Ndume said. <laughs> but when, when you saw him for the first time, uh, I'm sure that there would have been recognition. He would be pleased to see you. Um, how did the conversation go? Yeah. yeah, he was very happy to see me, definitely recognized me. He kept wanting me to get closer. Um, and the, where I was when I first saw him, I couldn't because there was a barrier up. So by the end, he was getting frustrated <laughs> that I couldn't get closer, but we got to spend time that way behind the scenes a little bit later. But I, I was asking him how, if he was okay, um, you know, what he wanted me to do. He wanted to play a little bit of chase telling him I was happy to see him. Um, and every time I would pause a little bit in the way we were communicating or interacting, he would kiss or clap like he wanted me to do more. So it, it was a wonderful experience to be able to go visit him and see him doing well and adjusting to the new environment. Um, but still- did, you know, did anyone record that? I, <laughs> no. Wasn't permitted. Yeah, I'm not permitted to make any recordings when I go. So, and and they let me be with him, just me and him. So, which was nice for me. That was very kind of them, but uh, what a shame not to record that. Yeah. Not until we get a neural link, Ian, will we be able to record <laughs> stuff like that? <laughs> uh, Penny, uh, I wanted to say that uh, in their 80s, it was discovered that male gorillas were prone to cardiomyopathy and females not. And um, what we know about gorillas is that the male, the dominant male is responsible for his family in all ways. The females don't really have the care in the world, they have baby, they take care of the baby. But what it was brought up at the meetings at that time is that the, the male gorillas cannot 
protect their family. They cannot move that family away from hordes of humans and abusive knocking and throwing things and, and even insults. And they do understand when, when they're being mocked. Uh, so that it seems that zoos should take that into consideration for nothing else, the health of the male gorillas, that they don't die younger um, from cardiomyopathy. So that's, I think, something we need to address. Uh, Ian, anything that, uh, that you meant to say, this would be a good time. Well, what, what I meant to do, actually, was yeah. to um, share my screen for a moment. Okay. So just let me do that and uh, pull up, because people uh, might be curious to see some videos of the different kinds of gorillas. I don't have Cross River gorillas, but if you go to my YouTube channel, um, first of all, there's a, a two and a half minute video called Gorilla Mums, which I think says more about gorilla communication in two and a half minutes than a library full of scientific papers and books. You, you just watch it and it's mother infant communication and then it's mother mother communication and it it doesn't take long but that's and that, those are western lowland gorillas in Limbe Wildlife Center a uh, sanctuary in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. um, this one um, of a silverback gorilla eating termites he's a real redhead as you were saying uh, Penny. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Western Lowland gorillas often have a red crown. Sometimes it extends right down onto the shoulders. Mm -hmm. So um, that's Western Lowland. Um, and then there's a number of mountain gorilla clips. There's a silverback beating his chest there. Um, and one which has recently um, got a lot of attention, which is this one. Let's go to full screen. Um, this is an Eastern Lowland gorilla showing that gorillas really can climb trees very, very well. A lot of the old textbooks say they're too big and heavy to climb trees. Well, hmm. this is um, Chimanuka, who is uh, possibly the biggest silverback in the world because he's a, a fully mature member of the largest subspecies of gorilla, Eastern Lowland gorilla. How much do you think he weighs? Um, it's very hard to say. About the same as you and me and Penny put together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what he's doing there, actually, is using his weight to break off this sapling um, because there's a parasitic plant growing at the top of it that he'd spotted and he's obviously not going to climb to the very top of a little tree like that so and, and I was with Gordon Buchanan making a documentary for the BBC um, and then there's another film of him down in the vegetation eating the parasitic plant I'm going to cancel that because that's not one of mine um, so <laughs> Yes, um, if, 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 if you either, for including in this film or anyone watching it, wants to look around the different kinds of gorillas, except for Cross River, you're, you're only going to find those, the camera trap footage on the WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society website. Um, but on mine, you, you'll get the other three kinds of gorillas and a few other species as well, um, which might uh, help. And, and the other uh, thing is the, the Vico tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, vicotourism.org and if you go down the news channel past those you'll get to here happy world gorilla day um, that gives you a chance to visit the gorillas with a, a family from australia and um, then go up to old karisoki where the cabins used to be before they were all destroyed during the civil war uh, and then to the museum in the headquarters of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International, which tells you about Diane Fossey's work. So we're celebrating World Gorilla Day, the 24th of September, and that was created to mark the day that Diane Fossey set up the Karasoki Research Center, although what she initially did was pitch a tent in a clearing, mm. and around the tent grew the Karasoki Research Center uh, until the Civil War in the early 90s, and after the, the genocide and peace returned to Rwanda um, for the past, um, gosh, 25 years now, uh, Karasoki has been a research center in the town. And right now, as many people will know if they've watched the Ellen show, um, Ellen and her um, wife, Portia, have, have donated money to build a new campus. Right. Diane Foss's um, future 
is guaranteed um, Diane Foss's work's future. Her work is, is continuing uh, with the building of this campus, which is going to be a, a, a center for research and conservation and education in Rwanda. Um, so there are lots of very exciting and positive things happening with the mountain gorillas and their conservation. And we do need to channel some of that energy into the other kinds of gorillas. And one of the first things we're going to do is to find the funds to do what you were saying, get Tony Rose's book printed and distributed throughout the Central and West African countries where gorillas are still regarded as a, either a food item or magical properties and show people that they, they have self-awareness, that they are gorilla beings and therefore uh, should not be killed, quite apart from the fact that it's illegal and you'll end up in prison if you do it, but it's just ethically wrong to kill such an intelligent social mammal. So Ellen DeGeneres, if you're listening, you can make an even bigger difference than you've already made. We'll, we'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Um, this was great. Um, I hope we continue the dialogue. We'll have more of these. We'll invite more people. We'll make it even more interactive. And I will post all the links as part of this video so people can visit uh, your site, Ian, and our site and see what we're doing with Kids for Coco, teaching sign language, having Coco teach sign language to the world to, to expand interspecies communication. And it's all done by communication, folks. And thank you for being a part of this. Hopefully, hopefully this, this whole thing will be streaming on EcoStreams before very long. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we'll tell people about that too. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you, Krista. Bye. Good Bye. to see you. Bye. Bye. Remember to visit the Gorilla Foundation, Coco.org, KidsForCoco.org, to learn more about what we're doing in gorilla conservation and care, and learn to sign with Coco, as well as Ian Redmond's YouTube channel, where you see some great. Mountain Gorilla videos, including one called Gorilla Mums, and his VicoTourism.org website, where you get a panoramic view of World Gorilla Day 2017 with the Mountain Gorillas. Uh, he also has a website called EcoStreams.com, where he'll be featuring new conservation-based videos in the coming months. Uh, and you can download a fantastic report by the IUCN on the status of gorillas as endangered species by Googling IUCN and GRASP Report 2018. Finally, you can email us at talk at coca.org with your questions and ideas. We'll respond to as many as possible. Thanks. See you again soon. <laughs>